My name is Terry Shepard, and I will be your guide into the world of close quarter battle. I'm a current U.S. Army Green Beret, and I have fought in two armed conflicts in the Middle East. Initially, I was trained to fight in the European theater to protect the U.S. and its Western allies from the Soviet Union during the heart of the Cold War. As a Green Beret, I had to learn an Eastern Bloc language and be prepared to infiltrate behind enemy lines to link up with, train, and fight alongside partisans to defeat the Red Army in their very own backyard. In other words, I had to be really good at guerrilla warfare. Although the Cold War is technically over, we now face a new global conflict, terrorism. To combat this threat, I've got to be an expert in the techniques of close quarter battle. Together, we'll explore how elite soldiers and police units use these specific techniques, weapons and technologies to defeat their enemies at very close range. The term close quarter battle is used to describe scenarios that police and military face in both urban and rural environments. Although the origin of close quarter battle goes back to sword fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat, today it's used primarily to describe the techniques when small teams are confronting an enemy inside a building or within a compound. Stairwells, hallways, and rooms always pose dangerous and unknown variables. From basic muzzle awareness, weapons transitions, to silent team communication, all police and military units need to be as good as they can possibly be at close quarter battle. In today's episode, we'll take a closer look at improvised explosive devices, also known as IEDs. We will also take a look at how the BMP armored personnel carrier assists in close quarter battles. And then we'll examine how it's vulnerable to attack by improvised explosive devices and rocket propelled grenades. We will look at a real CQB scene from the Russian Chechnya conflict and see how a Russian armored personnel carrier responds to getting hit by an IED and ambushed by guerrillas. Finally, I'll be looking at a Czech version of the classic AK-47 weapon system and shooting it on the range. Although most people think of the improvised explosive device as a tool used in Afghanistan and Iraq, the truth is, it's been used a long time before this. After the Cold War ended, a lot of unexploded Soviet bombs and demolition equipment became available on the international black market. This material could easily be used by anybody who had a basic knowledge in engineering and explosives to be refashioned into a remote-controlled roadside bomb. At the right moment, the terrorists would detonate the explosive and ambush the confused and wounded enemy. This type of an attack is a perfect example of how guerrilla forces also use the three rules of close quarter battle, surprise, speed, and violence of action. In today's episode of Close Quarter Battle, we are going to look back at the Russian military involvement in Chechnya and how that David and Goliath story demonstrates why a larger military force can be brought to its knees by a much smaller irregular guerrilla force using techniques similar to those of special forces.
As the Cold War ended, Russia struggled to maintain control of some of its former Soviet Union territories. When Chechnya declared full independence from Moscow, Boris Yeltsin, then president of the Russian Federation, opposed this declaration, arguing that Chechnya had not been an independent entity within the former Soviet Union. The ensuing conflict was mainly between three groups, the Russian military, the ruling Chechen army, and the Chechnya resistance, which was mainly made up of Muslim Mujahideen forces, many of which were foreign fighters. In this conflict, the Chechnya resistance usually fought unconventionally by using IEDs and ambushing regular Russian units. This technique has devastating effects, despite the fact that it can be created by relatively simple means, using mostly homemade electronics and acquired explosives. IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Such a simple acronym, but it can strike fear into the heart of any soldier. When I first came in the Army, we learned things like mine warfare and booby traps. And a booby trap could be something as simple as stretching a line across a trail attached to a grenade pin. And when you, when you kick the line, the grenade pin pulls out, the grenade blows up. It could be a pit in the ground with some spikes in it that you fall into, may not kill you, but it can hurt you. Mines, anti-personnel and anti-armor were something we learned how to emplace and then how to retrieve. IEDs kind of combine the technology and the mindset of both. The key to IEDs really are two things. Knowledge of your enemy, who you're trying to kill, and knowledge of the terrain. The making of an IED can actually be a really simple process. It depends on what you've got and what you want to do. For example, an Iraqi insurgent gets a hold of several artillery shells. If he knows what he's doing, he can open them up and attach a detonator inside. Now, with the advent of all this electronic equipment, cell phones, garage door openers, it's really easy to make that detonator be able to put some kind of a signal that when you even call it, it will detonate it. It doesn't take a lot of technology. All it takes is a lot of imagination and a lot of creativity and some real astute judgment of the terrain and the enemy. An IED is also referred to as a roadside bomb, and that's precisely how it's used. Typically, they explode to the side of or underneath the vehicle to cause the maximum amount of damage. During the Second Iraq War, IEDs were used extensively against coalition forces. By the end of 2007, IED attacks in Iraq were responsible for more than half of coalition deaths. And with IED attacks increasing every year in Afghanistan, this method of attack has now become the most common against NATO forces. With a little bit of training, as much ordnance and explosives as he can scrounge up, and a knowledge of the terrain and the movement of his opponent, an insurgent can set up a really nasty surprise. Take this for example. Here we've got a tank round and a mortar round. With a little creativity, you're able to chain these together explosively. If you don't have these kind of rounds, even if you have raw explosives, you can do that as well. In this case, with these kind of rounds, you can use the terrain to aim them where you want them to go. And so imagine adding three, four, five, ten of these things and a vehicle's coming down the road. You can activate it remotely with some kind of electronic device or there could be something like a pressure plate or some other way to set it off when the vehicle goes over. IEDs are of course physically destructive and they kill people and destroy equipment, but almost as importantly is their fear factor. Just knowing that this could be waiting for you around any corner at any time is gonna really make you think about what you do. Coming up, I'm gonna take a look at the Russian BMP, armored personnel carrier, how it was used and how it was ultimately defeated in the Chechnya conflict. CQB, or close quarter battle, is the term used by elite military and police for the techniques used at close range scenarios from built up urban areas to more rural compounds. Today we're examining the armored personnel carrier, 
any IED or improvised explosive device, the M1 Abrams tank is the U.S. military's primary battle tank. With its 120mm bore cannon and 50 caliber machine guns, the Abrams tank has been an essential part of supporting close quarter battle operations. BMP is a Soviet amphibious tracked fighting vehicle and was mass produced. It combines the principles of an armored personnel carrier and a tank by adding the option of a light 73mm cannon and an anti-tank guided missile launching system. The BMP allowed infantry to operate in relative safety and allowed small teams both mobility and speed in rural and urban campaigns. As a result of the Soviet Union's involvement in Afghanistan in the 1980s, they improved the BMP with more updated armor and technology. All right, so I am in a BMP-1, which is interesting for me because when I came in the Army in 1988, I spent a lot of time and energy figuring out how to defeat one of these things. When the Soviets came out with this in the 60s, this was a huge problem for NATO because they had nothing to really answer this with. It was capable of about 70 kilometers an hour. It was amphibious, so it could swim. It had a lot of different weapon systems. You could launch rockets. Um, there was a heavy machine gun, several light machine guns, and the men inside could put their weapons outside of ports and basically effectively cover 360 degrees. It had a crew of three and was able to transport eight guys to a fight and then support them. Now, over time, armored personnel carriers and that concept continue to develop and get better. We have some really good ones in the American military. The Bradley Fighting Vehicle and the Stryker come to mind. Bradley and Stryker fighting vehicles are combat vehicles which have additional fighting capacity in the form of heavier weapons or missile systems to both support and carry personnel into battle. Armored personnel carriers provide basic and off-road abilities and support to troops conducting close quarter battle operations. Providing safety to troops inside, but equipped with heavy caliber machine guns, they protect troops entering and during operations. How do you defeat something like this? It's heavy, it's pretty fast, it's got a lot of weapon systems. How would you defeat it? One place it's vulnerable for sure is in the back. The troop doors are rather light and there's gas tanks in there, so that's a great place to attack it. All right, I'm in the back of the BMP-1. This is where the infantry soldiers would actually load up. The crew of three is in the middle and in the front. Four men on each side, full kit, all their weapons, all their gear. This is a really tight space, very uncomfortable place to be. It's really vulnerable to attack because the metal's a bit thinner, but more importantly, there's fuel in here, and you can see the fuel lines that run into the cabin. What they're often attacked with was this. Now, what you're looking at here is actually the rocket that the BMP would fire itself, but from here up, You've probably seen these in movies and in TV shows. This is what's fired from an RPG-7. What would take place is that the BMP would be stopped, either with an IED blast or a mine, and now it would be ambushed, either from the top, from the sides, or the back. You could even be really nasty and wait till the guys open the door and then just shoot an RPG right into the cabin. Let's have a look at the second way to attack a BMP. Here's what you don't do you don't attack it from the front. If you look, it's in a wedge shape with very thick armor, so most weapon systems are gonna bounce right off of it. The best way to attack this vehicle is from underneath, either with a mine or an IED. You can pop through the skin under, or you can take off the tread, and now the BMP is not moving, and it can't do what it was designed to do, to move forward aggressively and quickly. You can now attack it from all sorts of different angles and it's very demoralizing for the guys inside who may not even know what's going on. The principles of CQB are absolutely applied here. Surprise, speed, violence of action. Surprise, these guys are driving along on a road and all of a sudden a mine goes off and now they're not moving. Speed, speed doesn't always have to do with increasing your speed. It can also mean taking away the speed of your enemy. The BMP is supposed to go forward, it's supposed to go fast. Now it can't, so you've surprised it, you've shut down its speed, now you apply the violence. 
Now you find the angles that are the best way to kill it. You get the guys in the back and you overwhelm either the individual vehicle or the convoy. In combat, everything, offensive or defensive, can be defeated. You've just got to figure out how to do it. We will take a closer look at how a single improvised explosive device can cause an entire armored division to literally stop in its tracks. We go inside the head of an elite Russian unit as they hunt down a Chechnya resistance IED maker. Close Quarter Battle, also known as CQB, is a collection of techniques used by police and military teams when fighting in compounds, buildings, and smaller battle areas. All right, you go ahead. IED, or Improvised Explosive Device. The IED, or Improvised Explosive Device, is essentially a homemade bomb that is placed in a well-traveled area and detonated remotely when an enemy force is traveling through, often with vehicles. Chechnya is a small region in the Northern Caucasus where the Russian military was locked in a bitter conflict in the 1990s. Although a large military has seemingly endless resources and technology at its disposal, they're also burdened by this infrastructure and it can slow them down. A small guerrilla unit, although lacking the technical and resource support, can operate in a clandestine manner and needs to utilize public opinion to sway support for their cause. Looking back to the Crusades, the colonial battles in Africa, or even the American Indian Wars in North America, you can see many examples of guerrilla warfare where smaller groups could win battles against very large traditional colonial forces using techniques we would refer to now as terrorism. Terrorism is the organized, premeditated use of violence by non-state or state-sponsored groups against combatants or non-combatants in order to advance an ideological goal. After the Cold War ended, the Western world considered Muslim extremism to be the biggest source of terrorist threats, the biggest of these threats being explosives and chemical weapons used on civilian populations or diplomatic stations around the world. Now let's go into the head of an elite Russian soldier as he and his partner dive into the catacombs of a bombed out Groznyan building looking for Chechnyan rebels. Because IEDs caused uncountable Russian casualties, tracking down and eliminating IED bomb makers was of utmost importance to the Russian military leaders during both Chechnyan wars. Now let's have a closer look at the Kalashnikov, AK. Design work on the AK-47 began in the last year of World War II. In 1947, the fixed stock version was introduced to selected units of the Soviet Army. In 1949, the AK-47 was officially accepted by the Soviet Armed Forces and used by the majority of the member states of the Warsaw Pact. Now sometimes simpler is better, and in that case, I definitely think that describes the AK-47. Easily the most ubiquitous assault rifle in the world today. Everywhere I've gone, all over the world, we see these. This is a couple different models of the AK-47. In general, they all fire a 7.62 millimeter bullet, which is pretty darn big. This one you see has a, a stock, which we've already kept collapsed. So you can see this is nice and easy to carry into a small space. And you have this hanging on your chest, it's nothing. For more accurate long range shots, you can go ahead and extend the stock, which we've done here. Pull it in tight and up you go. This has got, uh, again, single shot and automatic uh, capability to it. This weapon was around well before Vietnam, and you know what? I still see it everywhere. We've got to learn how to use them, we've got to learn how to take them apart, and we've got to learn how to deal with the threat that they impose. 
I am firing the Czech equivalent of the AK-47, the VZ-58. The VZ-58 is an assault rifle designed and manufactured in Czechoslovakia and accepted into service in the late 1950s as the Samopal Vzor 58 submachine gun. Externally, the VZ-58 resembles the Soviet AK-47, but internally, it has a substantially different design which shares no parts with the Kalashnikov design. When you say it's an original Czech weapon, meaning it was designed and built in the Czech Republic. Yes. Wow, okay. And every soldier in Czech Republic know you guys all know how to use this, this weapon. This, this is your gun. Service. If you're a good shooter, it's accurate. A bit of a heavier kick, maybe not as accurate as these because of the older technology with the barrel and the rifling and the ammo, but reliability is not a bad thing, especially in a you know in an austere environment. So this will be fun to shoot. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to be a little bit better than me at this. Coming up, I take a final look at the devastating effects of the improvised explosive device as Chechen rebels ambush a Russian armored column and start a firefight. Close quarter battle, or CQB, are the techniques used by international police and military when they are engaging an armed enemy in a small battle space or a building. Today we're exploring the CQB techniques used by guerrilla forces against larger military armored units to force them into a defensive firefight. The armored personnel carriers are moving down a road when the IED explodes disabling the lead vehicle. As the Russian forces dismount and head toward a safe position, the rebels move into an ambush. The Russian forces retreat toward a building to get cover from the advancing rebels. The rebels move into a firing position on the building. In turn, the Russian forces create a flanking force to push back the Chechnyans. All three elements of CQB are literally being used by both sides in this IED attack and ambush. Surprise, the ambush of the rebels and the flanking maneuver of the Russians. Speed. Both the rebels and the Russians are moving fast but controlled, taking advantage of the moment of surprise and violence of action. Both sides are using overwhelming fire to push the enemy into a defensive position. In today's episode of CQB, we learned about armored personnel carriers and IEDs. and that an armored personnel carrier is not always the safest place to be. We also looked at the AK-47 and its Czechoslovakian equivalent, and we examined how a small rebel guerrilla force can defeat a large military force through three essential elements of CQB, surprise, speed, and violence of action. <laughs>